everyone, I'm Alan Seals from the Talks at Google team, and today we have the absolute pleasure to welcome back to the Talks program one of my favorite people that I have ever had the pleasure of listening to, Mr. Mo Gadot. Mo is an entrepreneur, a writer, the former business the former chief business officer for Google X and the author of the amazingly popular book, Solve for Happy. His newest book, which is called Scary Smart, The Future of Artificial Intelligence and How You Can Save Our World, provides an in-depth, real, sometimes scary, yet somewhat refreshing view of how every single one of us, techie or not, can unknowingly uh, help change the future of AI, we carry a responsibility to change our world for the better through positive influence over our current AI infants. And if you don't know what that means, don't worry, we're getting into the, we're going to get into that very soon. So let's dive into this. Mogadot, welcome back to Google. Thank you, Alan. It's such a pleasure to be here. I, you, you, you know, I feel very much at home. I uh, I was, you know, like, okay, this is really be my place. I, I know you guys. I know the place. You, you were so kind of me, to me with uh, Soul for Happy. And I hope we will have a good conversation about this one now. Oh, absolutely. Uh, and I want to start off with the title, Scary Smart. And I want to use that to describe you because no, you are no, just no, no, incredibly no, no. scary smart. No, uh, no. Your analysis of, the, of all of this, no matter what you put your mind to, is incredible. But we'll move past that. So the book is probably more about, I want to say, existentialism than tech or AI, right? So I want to actually read the opening yeah. from the book, which in your words, technology is putting our humanity at risk to an unprecedented degree. This book is not for engineers who write the code or the policymakers who claim they can regulate it. This is a book for you, meaning all of us watching right now, because believe it or not, you are the only one that can fix it. So you've been working in tech now for over three decades and helped make Google X, of course, what it is today. And you probably know a bunch of secrets that we're still not allowed to know yet. But <laughs> let's start here at the beginning. AI is here. And you say in the book, it is inevitable. Why does good. this have the potential to be good or bad for us? So like we're at a crossroads right now. So I want you to explain a little bit of this as you write about it in the book. Yeah, I, I, th I think there are a couple of definitions that we need to start with. AI is not another technology. We have never developed a technology like this before. Every technology we've ever developed since, you know, the a hammer uh, all the way to supercomputers has been nothing more than a glorified slave, really. You know, they, they appear to be very intelligent, some of those tools, but they were tools. They did exactly as we told them. This is not the case with AI. With AI, we are not building a slave that will behave as we tell it to do. We're building the capability to acquire intelligence. And when intelligence is acquired, many, many of those machines, I call them machines metaphorically here, but they really are not, as we, I hope we would talk about later, the many, many of those machines have quite an autonomy to be able to, uh, to, to learn on their own, to acquire knowledge on their own, at least in the future, and to make decisions based on that. So they're no longer... Uh, they cannot be put within the category of they're going to listen to what we do. That's number one. Number two is I actually, in Scary Smart, uh, uh, do not claim to be a futurist. I, you know, there are so many others that are so much better than me at this. Uh, I think all of us, without, uh, without exception, everyone who looks at the future of AI agrees to one thing and one thing only. And that thing is that it's a singularity. It's a singularity, meaning it's an event horizon beyond which we're unable to actually detect what's going to happen. We can't predict how a game will play out when the rules of the game change so drastically that the game itself is changing. And I, you know, to, to sum it up in very simple words, uh, as per, you know, Ray Kurzweil, for example, who predicts that uh, by 2029, artificial intelligence will be smarter than us. That's eight years from today. Ray have been, has been right before. He's been, he missed a few dates before, but it doesn't matter if it's 2029 or 2035 or whatever it is. Sooner or later, we will get to a point where the episode of history that started with humanity being the smartest being on the planet will end. We will be the apes and there will be something else smarter than us. And when that new episode starts, the, the rules of the game change so drastically that it becomes unknown what will end up happening for all of us. And, and I, what I'm trying to say with Scary Smart is that there could be a future where we build an, an amazing utopia that fixes all of the problems that humanity has uh, caused us so far. 
or it could be a dystopia and we could suffer on the on the way and scary smart is basically the wake up call that tells people it's about time we start discussing this i want to throw up um this graph that came out of your out of the book and it sort of shows what you were just talking about is that we've had a very almost flat tr uh, growth trajectory over the last several decades and then right here within the span of about 20 years we have just all of a sudden started to see this hockey stick effect in the graph and i i want to actually sort of ask if you still believe that this is a linear line looking you know, going up about 45 degrees or if it's going to start you know become asymptotic and and become vertical because if as machines are writing their own programming and making their own children i feel like this is just going to get <laughs> exponentially bigger and bigger and faster and faster Absolutely. It's double exponential in every way. It's Naren's law, which actually comes from Google. And, and the idea here is, so I, I take the reader through stages of understanding. Hmm? This chart was one of the early charts that I was trying to say, look, if you took where we are in AI today from the moment AI started in 1956, when we sort of, you know, the inception of talking about AI, you may think that the chart is going like this right you know a little bit upwards but the truth is most of the progress happened since we discovered deep learning and deep learning was really around the turn of the century and since that it the graph literally went all the way upwards you know forget that i presented here with a line it's not a line i'll explain that in a minute but but that graph here is the interest in AI, is the investment in AI, is the amount of code that we're writing in AI. It's the whole thing is becoming around AI. There is no startup today that can actually secure any funding if they didn't drop the word AI in the process, right? And so, and so when you start to think about that, you realize that it's 20 years where you had that gain, and so that the graph is very, very steep. The, mm -hmm. interesting, the interesting side of it as well is that this graph, as anyone who understands Moore's law or, you know, the law of accelerating return, is not even linear. It is exponential. And as per Naren's law, it's double exponential. So it really, really is not only very steep, but it's also becoming steeper over time because of, you know, the fact that we, technology doubles in every 12 to 18 months. Uh, you know, at the same cost as Moore's law and so on. So, so when you start to see this, the predictions become quite staggering. And once again, I borrow a, a prediction from Ray Kurzweil, who's, you know, our favorite. It, it, basically, Ray predicts that by 2045, I say 2049, the machines will be a billion times, a billion with a B, a billion mm -hmm. times smarter than us. Now, now that analogy uh, I don't, again, I don't want to say it's scary, but it definitely is a singularity because that makes us no longer the apes. That's a comparison where if the machines are Einstein, we're a fly. And, and you know, you really have to start wondering how do you keep the interest, uh, uh, you know, in, 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 uh, you know the, 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 our best interest in the mind of Einstein when we're a fly. And a lot right. of conversation is happening around that, but I don't think it's sufficient. Right. So, so you actually, you use this analogy in the book too, that if, you know, the machines, we'll call AI, we won't call them machines because you also mm -hmm. say that we are machines, we are just biological okay. machines. So to call Absolutely. something a machine is sort of uh, irrelevant, yeah. but um, so AI is going to be the super smart Einstein. We as normal homo sapiens are going to be the fly. And so we right now to, to go further, right? When a fly comes around us, we, we try to kill it. We don't like flies. We smack exactly. it smack it Absolutely. down Absolutely. and so that's that's where we sort of are now and i think very uh aptly like scary smart it the, the title has many many different meanings but the scary part of all of this is that like you have outlined in the book that we have just birthed this this infant ai like it, it is at its infancy if we were yeah. to use a parent child analogy and so again, taking from the book, right? You use this wonderful Clark Kent, Superman sort of analogy of the super conscious, super being that fell to earth. It's this baby and it has the potential to be a superhero or a super villain, depending on how it is taught. Totally. And so that's exactly where we are now with AI. And as you said, it's only happened in the last 20 years, this has become really a true reality. Uh, yeah, and I, I think there are two very interesting sides to this. Huh? One is, let's talk about that infant bit before, before we talk about Superman and supervillain. I think the infant here is probably a lot more true than most people think. Most people who do not 
uh, really engage with AI, they don't understand hmm, that these are much more resembling a sentient being than they are a machine, right? A, a, a car, uh, you know, magnifies human mobility. So you can walk at five kilometers an hour or get in a car and, and you know, drive at 260 or 280 or whatever, right? Now, so that magnification, however, you're still holding the wheel. You're still pushing the brakes. A self-driving car, you don't say anything. Okay, I mean, self-driving cars of the future, uh, like any other form of AI, will start to become so much smarter than us that we will not have the influence on them. I mean, think about Google's ad engines or, you know, Instagram or Twitter recommendation engines. There is not a single human and the four, five, ten billion recommendations that those engines are throwing out every now and then. Hmm? Nobody, no, no human can walk in and say, hold on, hold on, don't show this to Alan. Nobody can do that. The machines are completely autonomous. Now, the, the idea in, in, in considering them a sentient being starts from the fact that they are birthed. Okay, there is a point in uh, to, uh, a starting point of their life. Mm -hmm. Like you so eloquently said, they're encouraged to procreate. So they're encouraged to keep their better codes and, and throw away the weaker ones. Uh, in that process, they look for knowledge. Okay, we, we direct them at knowledge and they're more and more looking for more knowledge like our habits and our behaviors and so on and so forth. They use that to develop their own intelligence. They have agency to affect the decisions they make based on that intelligence. And then they're at, at a threat of dying. If a, if a tidal wave hits a data center, an AI will die. Right. And mm -hmm. so when you really start thinking about that autonomy, that agency, that, uh, you know, free will, if you want. Hmm? You start to wonder, are, are these really machines at all when nobody is telling them anything to do? Now, if that's the case, then the analogy to Superman becomes very, very, very valid. Because what is the most effective superpower on planet Earth? Honestly, it's intelligence, right? Intelligence is what created the empire that humanity, the civilization that we created is because of our intelligence. Now, that's the ultimate superpower. And now here is a new being, sentient, hmm, that has this amazing superpower in so much abundance that is a billion times more than us. Hmm? And now you have one moment, which is before Superman becomes a man and goes out to the world and affects his superpower on the planet, what did Clark Kent, what, sorry, did Daddy Kent, uh, Kent Sr. want, right? What, right? Did he want him to become, uh, you know, pro-humanity, pro-protect and serve? Or did he want him to rob banks and make him more money and, you know, kill his enemies? Because the, the, the beautiful infant would have gone either way. And it would have ended up with Superman or supervillain. And I think that starts to get us to question, what are we telling this beautiful infant? This prodigy of intelligence that we have that is literally sitting there with their eyes sparkling saying, tell me what you want. I can do anything. Do you want me to win a, a game of Go? I will. Do you want me to become a killer robot? I will too, right? And, and you know, the idea is what is Kent, our, us, uh, their parents, what are we telling them? Oh, there's so many places that, that I want to go with this uh, because the 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 ai itself initially could be said to be flawed in that it is being programmed by humans who are fallible and then these humans are being funded by a paycheck that is coming from some sort of investor that in theory has some sort of uh need to get a financial gain out of it whether it is uh a somebody who's serving an ad that is directly targeted, like literally created, generated and served to you within milliseconds between you typing in your, your search query and, and seeing your results uh, or whether or not it's, you know, we're talking about defense contracting and all sorts of other, like really, really scary stuff. Mm -hmm. And yeah. so at, at what point do you think though, that, that, I mean, do you think there's a point where, there can be any sort of fail safe like if if you keep a machine inside a firewall will it be smart enough to hack through because like you were saying that the the intelligence of these machines especially now with quantum computing the, that yes, breakthrough sure. absolutely right yeah i so, mean ha hands down so you see there are so so what what you talk about in computer science we call the control problem 
right? And, you know, since 1956 and Alan Turing and, you know, the Turing tests and all of that, we were all about the control problem. It's like, hey, continue to the, the development of AI because by the time we develop them, we will have figured out how to control them, right? And, you know, I discussed the technical side of, of, of controlling AI lightly in Scary Smart. I remember this is not a book for techies, but also you need a bit of substance to understand how things really work. And then I basically boil it down. The control problem, just for those who are not techies, is we're going to box them, we're going to tripwire them, we're going to stunt them, or we're going to uh, um, uh, get, put them in simulations where they don't know if it's the reality or not, so they have to behave. Okay. Now, when you when you really start to think about this, you know there are many ways where I can tell you why boxing is not going to work, why st stunning uh, is not you know going to be in the best interest of the. Uh, of the business investor and so on and so forth. But the answer is really straightforward. If you if you forego all of the detail, the answer is human arrogance. Hmm? We are so arrogant to believe that something is a billion times smarter than us, and yet we, the smartest being on the planet, are going to contain it. Okay? Where does that come from? Like, everyone knows, everyone's ever worked in technology. And again, in, in Google, we had amazing work on security, which actually is something I've, I'm very proud of. Huh? The, the, the truth is, the smartest hacker in the room always finds a way, right? In Google, we did it so well, but so many others get hacked all the time. Hmm? And the smartest hacker in the room is still a human. Hmm? Now, when, when the smartest hacker in the room is not a human, and it's a billion times smarter, there is no containing them. That's number one. Number two is, and I say that with a ton of respect, there is a massive, massive, massive difference between slogans and reality, okay? So mm -hmm. I ask the question, and I'm very open about this, how many developers that coded a line of AI today have actually included any control code in their code at all, okay? Zero. One. 100%, I assure you, nobody's investing in this. There is no regulation behind it. Nobody's talking about it. And you have five developers that are supposed to push out a few thousand lines of code this week, right? Would you have them write the lines of code that are going to create a company you can sell and a business that will make you money? Or are you going to sit them down and tell them to write control code that doesn't add any value to your, to your proposition at all? Right? Nobody is including any control measures and, you know, including two young teenagers sitting in some place in Singapore and coding stuff today using Kubernetes and, you know, other, uh, other technologies around all of the cloud computing and all of the cloud AI that we have no clue is happening. Nobody's regulating it and it's not under control, will never be under control. Well, so then, so the I guess the going back to the arrogance and the lack of control, right? Because it, I guess that that gets down to the existentialist existentialism part of the whole discussion, and and basically just like ethics, right? Because how do you program <clears throat> how do you program AI to be ethical? And then what is that definition of ethical? Because oh, yeah. because you know I could think that there's always like the top one percent. If they have, if they spread out all their wealth, then there would be no poverty, no more poverty in the world. So what if an AI comes in and hacks all the banks and spreads out all the money? Beautiful. And so, right. What's that? Beautiful. I love that thought. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> I mean, in, a, in an interesting way. Uh, so, so I, again, you, you always ask questions that cover several topics. Huh? So I actually believe eventually we'll end up in a utopia. Okay. Uh, and, and I hope we come back to this conversation. So Scary Smart is not a book of fear. It, it would have sold more copies. I mean, selling really well, thankfully. It's been number one in many categories since it came out. But but it is. it would have sell, sold a lot more if I played the same game and just made it scary. Okay. No, the first five chapters of the book are, are the scary part. Okay. Where basically I'm sort of waking people up saying the truth of what we need. To, to be to be looking at, but then the second five, uh, you know, are basically what I call the smart part and and how we can do something about it. And my perception is that eventually things will be okay, right? But they're not going to be okay because we found a stronger chain where we can chain this genie to a wall and put it in a in a lamp, right? Uh, you know, we, we we cannot force our way through something that is so much more intelligent than us. The only way you can 
you know, and, and Marvin Minsky, Marvin Minsky is actually, you know, sort of considered the father of AI, the founder of the original uh, Dartmouth, uh, Dartmouth workshop in, in, in 1956. He was interviewed and, and he was asked about the threat of AI and his answer was very straightforward. He did not talk about their abilities. He did not talk about their intelligence. He questioned and he said, because there is no way we can ensure that they have our best interest in mind, mm -hmm. right? And, and, and that's a very interesting way to look at it because best interest in whose mind? This is a machine. No, it's not a machine. Remember that. Mm -hmm. Now, th the question is this. If you have something that you don't consider a slave, remember how we are treated. We were treated in Google, for example, when I was at Google. You, you know, many of us were told you, can, you have your empowered. You, you can do certain things. You can, you know, uh, uh, work in certain ways. But don't break that code. Don't you know there is a code of conduct? You know, in the early years we used to we used the statement "Don't be evil" and so on and so forth. Mm -hmm. And all of those interesting sides hmm, of ethics was what was guiding uh, a human that is reasonably smart and has autonomy and can do things. Now, my favorite chapter of uh, of Scary Smart by a very long margin is a chapter is chapter eight, which is which is called the future of ethics. Now, you have to understand that it is not our intelligence that informs our decisions. It's our ethical code as seen through the lens of our, uh, lens of our intelligence that informs what you want to do. Um, and the example I give in Scary Smart is I talk about, you know, if you, if you raise a young lady in the Middle East, hmm, uh, she will grow up to believe that a conservative dress code is the right way to go. Hmm? Take the same lady with the same level of intelligence, raise her in Brazil on the Copacabana beach, and she will grow up to believe that a G-string is the right way to go, right? Mm -hmm. and, and, and is one of them smarter than the other? No. Is one of them right and the other wrong? No. It's just a different ethical, a different, a, a different traditional code, if you want, okay? Now, be, they, each of the ladies will use her intelligence to identify what ethical code is there and then apply that ethical code to make decisions. Now we have to say to, to see the same approach as the right approach to those in, in, infants, artificially intelligent infants today, because they're now building their ethical code. And in chapter eight, I speak openly about the fact that there are so many ethical questions. As a matter of fact, the chapter is mostly questions. I don't have answers. Hmm? Like, how, you know, what, what do you do if a, if a, if a, if a, if you start to have a society where you're not the only sentient being that is intelligent? Okay, what what would you do if a machine committed a crime? How how do we how do we you know um, um, define ethics around uh, cyber uh, um, virtual uh, vice, if you want? Okay, you know how you know is is a is a is a machine pretending to be a porn star different than a, an, a human porn star? If we choose that, then what are we telling the machine? Is humans are humans? Are we starting to discriminate against them already and tell them they're less, they're worth less than a human? You know, what if a car, a self-driving car, has an accident? Who who do you punish? Huh? Do you punish the car? How do you punish the car? Do you put it in jail for how long? Ten years, like a human, right? You know, ten years for a car is like eternity. Should, so should we put it in jail for two microseconds? How would how would the other machines respond when a flimsy human that is a billionth of their intelligence is putting one of them in jail? Right. And all of those ethical questions are so, you know, all around us. And we're not even starting the conversation to talk about them. More interestingly, which really was the purpose of that chapter, is to say, look, I have admitted to myself that there are three inevitables, that the machines are, you know, AI is going to happen. They're going to be smarter than us. And there is the risk of some mistakes. Right. And I've admitted that to myself. So I'm not trying to change it. I'm not trying to, to do what most you know, uh, 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 regulators are, are doing behind closed doors and talking about how we're going to control them. I've given up on that. Okay. I'm saying they're going to be out there. They're already out there. They've influenced your day so much already. Most of the information you've consumed in the last, you know, two years of your life was completely dictated by a machine. Your brain is completely formatted by a machine. Okay. Now, now when that is the case, hmm, how do we appeal to their ethics? And if we as humans decided to become good parents instead of the horrible parents that we are today, okay, uh, you know, if we decide to do that, what ethical code should we, you know, demonstrate in front of them? Humanity, sadly, 
has never agreed anything. We've mm -hmm. never agreed anything. So if I managed somehow to tell the entire human race, hey guys, look, let's just make them grow up to be ethicals, the quest uh, ethical, the question will be, so which ethics? Is patriotism the ethic? Or is you know a Buddhist approach of don't kill a fly, don't kill your enemy, is that the ethic? You know, we, we don't know, right? We don't know. And and so so the truth is, I realized that there were only three ethics that humanity's ever agreed. Only three things, call them ethics, call them morals, call them ways of life. Hmm? We all want to be happy. We all have the compassion for those we care about, even if you care about one person, okay? You you have the compassion to make that one person happy and and, and well. And we all want to love and be loved, okay? And in my mind, I'm starting to say, maybe this is the ethical code we should show, okay? Not the programmers, not the regulators, because they have no control of those machine over those machines. Once they're out there in the real world, they're learning from you and I. It's that last swipe you did on Instagram or on Twitter. It's the ad that you clicked on that is informing the machine Again, I say the machine that's informing the, the artificially intelligent infant hmm, what it is that humanity likes, what it is that is intelligence should dictate, what it is that it, sh it should communicate to us. And perhaps those three ethics hmm, are the ethics that we should show. Hmm? We should show them that we want to be happy as individuals. That's the way we deal with ourselves. We want others to be okay and happy. That's the way we deal with others. And I know this will sound really, really weird. Hmm? But I'm not, a pro I promise you, I'm not a hopeless romantic. You know me, I'm a very serious geek, okay? The, I, I think love is the way to deal with the machines, okay? I think we should show them love because the easiest way you can turn an infant into a psychopath is to deprive it of love. Mm -hmm. the, e the easiest way to create a serial killer is to have a child and deprive it of love. And, and I know it sounds weird, but in my mind, I look at those prodigies and I say, there's absolutely nothing wrong with the machines. Those machines... Truly, I am a parent, like with, one, with my kids. Hmm? Can I actually feel appreciative of the, uh, of, of, the, of, the, of the gift that they are and truly love them for what they are? Truly love we, Google. If we, don't, if we don't know where the machines are or how they're watching us and, and taking one step back to love, I agree with you that, that love and compassion is something that we need to show. And then they model their behavior after that. And they're programming their chil their artificial children to be the same way. But um, love, like our brains are a neural network of code. It, our instinct is code inherently written in our, in our biological machines of bodies, right? Okay. So, so how do, how do we then I mean, I, okay, so I agree with you that there's the argue, argument to be made that, that without being emotional, I'll put in air quotes, right? Without being an outwardly emotional uh, AI, that machines do feel emotion because they, like you said, they want to be, okay. they want to be successful. They are programmed to, they instinctually, they're, they're created from the start to be, to want to be successful and to want to feel this. So how are, how are we going to then with our actions, our everyday actions, not being techies, not being programmers, not being involved in, in the field that you have come from, how do we help shape where our future AI children go? How do we teach them these ethics? How, how do you teach a child any ethics? You become a good parent. The, the truth is, you know, if, if I'll, I'll give an example, and please don't think that I have a position for or against. When President Trump used to tweet, okay, uh, President Trump would, would tweet one tweet on the top, at the top, and then it would be followed with 30,000 hate, hate speech, okay? The first person that catches that tweet would insult the president, the second person would insult the first person, and the third person would insult everyone, right? <laughs> It's, it's crazy, really. We are horrible parents. Hmm? Now, of course, the machine is, you know, the Twitter machine is looking at this and saying, okay, first person doesn't like the president, noted, okay? But then very quickly, it starts to say, oh, humans are aggressive, okay? They don't like to be disagreed with, and when they're disagreed with, they bash each other, okay? My daddy and mommy are bashers. I'm going to bash them when they disagree with me. Right? And we've mm -hmm. seen many examples of that. Tay, the Microsoft Twitter bot, you know, uh, Alice, the, the, the Yandex Twitter bot, uh, sorry, the, the Yandex chat bot and, uh, or assistant, uh, you know, Norman, which was an MIT experiment. All of these were AIs 
that basically were completely unassuming. They were supposed to be out there to help everyone have a, a wonderful chat. And quickly, people started to show them aggressive comments, aggressive behaviors, and Tay become pro, became pro-killing and, and a racist and a sexist, and Alice was, uh, you know, uh, basically pro-Stalin and, and so on, right? Now, now the, those realities hmm, are not coded into the machines by the programmers. They are coded into the machines by us, their parents. Hmm? And, and the only way we can show the machines when, as their intelligence develops, remember, huh? today they don't really have a, a concept of ethics. They don't understand morals. They're one and a half years old. They're infants. Hmm? I mean, um, I, I, they're more older than one and a half, but metaphorically, they're one and a half years old. In human huh? years. Yeah, in human we're years, right? Dog years in human years. This is yeah, AI which, years and human years. Which, yes. which is really interesting, right? because human years, so a year and a half now, but very quickly, they'll be, they'll be a trillion years old because they develop very quickly in terms mm -hmm. of their intelligence. Now, having said that, so, so if we were to take those hmm, and try to show them in human ways, how to be ethical, okay? They will start to internalize this as the way to do things, okay? And and I and I, I basically, when I say that to people, people get even more scared. They go like, so what are you saying, Mo? The only way to save us from the machines becoming against us is for all of us to shape up and all of us to start to be nice and all of us to, you know, to, to are you trying to raise humanity again? It's impossible. No, I'm not at all. As a matter of fact, you know, I will tell you, I don't even need humanity to change. I think the challenge with our world today, Alan, is that um, humanity has learned to only show its worst. Okay, whether that's through, so, you know, mainstream media, which uses negativity to catch your attention. So, you know, they only report about that one woman that hit her boyfriend on the head. They don't report about the, you know, the, the, the nine million others in the same city that hit, you know, that kissed their boyfriends and girlfriends. Right. And, and, and the idea here is that if you actually take the statistical reality of humanity, there are many more that will kiss tonight than those that will hit each other on the head. Okay, and that's the truth. That, that that's the truth of humanity. I mean, I, in in my podcast uh, slow mo, I, I I interviewed Edith Ager. Edith is an amazing human being. She she was a, a Holocaust uh, survivor. She was uh, taken to Auschwitz when she was sixteen with her sister and mother. Her mother was sent to the gas chamber in front of her eyes, and she was a beautiful young ballerina. So she was actually tasked to entertain the angel of death while he was sentencing people to death, right? And, and Edith hmm, would tell the story, it's so beautiful, of how frail and, and weak she was. And then after dancing, they would give her a piece of bread and she would hide it in her pocket and go back to what she called her sisters and cut it and give it to everyone and sit next to them and support them and love them and hug them. Hmm? If I showed you a four hours documentary of World War II and what Hitler did, you would think that humanity scum. Okay, but if you listen to Edith talking, you would re realize how divine we are as a species. Okay, and that's the truth. The truth is, I'm not asking humanity to be any different. Every one of us has mistakes, every one of us has, you know, issues. Hmm? But if we all show the best of us, hmm? that's divine. If you've ever fell in love, you would understand how this, what this species is capable of. But, the, but we got messed up in the modern world we we want to watch negativity in the news we want to watch horror movies and violent uh, violent movies on on the screen and then when we behave behind our avatars on the internet we're rude we're you know we're really 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 not human in many many ways and all i'm asking is just like i had i have instilled doubt in your mind today hmm, by telling you the story of edith one person okay I just tell you the story of Edith and you go like, oh my God, that's, he's actually right. Humanity is not that bad, okay? Can enough of us show online and show the machines hmm, that humanity is not that bad? Can some of us please engage in that tweet with 30,000 hate speeches, okay? And say, hey, by the way, politely, I disagree with what you, th what, what, what you said. I respect that you have a point of view, okay? And here is my point of view and I don't mean not to offend anyone. Can some of us do this? Okay, can those of us who have walked the journey hmm, and started to become nicer or more enlightened, which normally walk away and leave the 
sorry to say, the dog fight. Huh? Most people who have worked on themselves will say, you know what, let them swipe. I don't care. I'm not, I'm not part of this anymore. Okay? I'm asking people to go back, to show, to show our best side so that our children, our artificially intelligent children, look at us and say, oh my God, these, you know, some of them are horrible. Like seriously, oh man, what was that comment over there? But Mo is my dad. I like this guy. This guy is good. Okay. Alan is nice. Yeah, Alan is good. Or anyone listening to us. Hmm? Can we instill doubt in the minds of the machines so that they actually question if humanity is all Hitlers or all Ediths? Mm -hmm. But as we speak, sadly, there are, they, you know, more of us are showing as Hitlers. Well, I want to I want to bring up this graph here too that it comes from the book. And and right. So at the bottom you've got average intelligence, and they're still in the, in the positive ethical rating if we want to give it that right and then you start to get the smarter humans who start to cut corners and um do things that are a little bit questionable and then as you start to reach the smartest and then you know as you're predicting here the smarter than the machines will be smarter than the smartest humans again could be just asymptotically so ethical that everybody, everything, every entity is treated equally with respect. And Absolutely. I think this is this is a wonderful sort of outlook to the whole thing that I hope, like, oh, I, I feel like over time, we're going to have to have the machines as they grow in intelligence uh, kind of go through the, the not so um, great stuff until they realize that it's not in their best interest to do bad things, what we're calling yeah. bad things, and get to that, you know, high, high right corner of the graph. Yeah, I, so, so I, I love that you br bring this up. So honestly, it's one of the graphs that's less discussed in the book, but it's to me the actual description of our future. Okay, so, so I, I dare say hmm, that the machines will go through three stages. They are now infants, so they're building their ethical code. They're going to become teenagers, and then they're going to become adults. Okay, when they're adults, they're going to be so much smarter than us that their intelligence will match the actual smartest being on the planet. I dare say that humanity is not the smartest being on the planet. Okay, the smartest being on the planet is life itself, because life can create without destroying, can gain without get without taking. Hmm? You, you see, we humans, when, when I want to make more money, I want to kill my competitor, okay? Life doesn't want this. Life wants abundance. Wants, it wants more tigers. It doesn't want to kill the tigers. It doesn't see any value in doing that. It wants more tigers and more deer. And, you know, some of the weaker deer will be eaten by the tigers. And then there will be a lot of poop and then accordingly a lot of trees. And, you know, it's, <laughs> it's really an interesting way of doing things. Huh? There is abundance. And I believe that the adult machines will very quickly realize that, will very quickly that there's absolutely no point hmm, in killing the fly, us, hmm, to preserve life, even though we're a very annoying fly. Right? They may they may choose to say, hey, by the way, if you really want to go surfing in Australia, can you please use a machine that is not polluting the planet? Okay. If if you really really are craving that uh, slice of watermelon in the supermarket around the corner that flies to you all the way from New Zealand, hmm, can we please do this with zero carbon footprint and not wrap it in single use plastic? Okay. And intelligence will help us get to those solutions. It's that teenage bit in the middle, Alan. That worries me. Like every teen, <laughs> like every teenager, huh? Do we really, can we really afford to have a super smart, super angry teenager? Okay. And and in the, the entire idea of scary smart is to say, can we please, can we please love them enough and show them hmm, that we're worthy so that they actually end up hmm, in a place where they really, really enjoy being good children to good parents. That's the whole idea. Either way, we're going to end up in a utopia. So, you know, eventually we will be in a good place. But let's not get that speed bump on the way. I think that would be quite painful for all of us. It's going it's, it's gonna to take a lot of forgiveness and a lot of... Okay, I, I, don't, I don't... Despair is not the right word. But I guess acceptance that... As you were saying, we are not the supreme being anymore. There's got to be a point at which, again, as a parent, to use this analogy, when you realize that you can't treat your children like children anymore, that they are their own adults yeah. and they make their own decisions. Yeah. So that they're smarter than you. They yes, and that's every parent's hope that your child is your children are smarter than you. And 
it it yeah you're right it's it is scary to think that we have super consciousness we are developing super consciousness that in within milliseconds can read sensors and no data and process analytics from a global data set of input in any given moment and which arguably again a separate conversation is that we are creating essentially godlike consciousness because it's all knowing everywhere global right so that's a whole different thing to get into but if we're creating this then as a teenager that is, you're right that is just amazingly frightening but then to get past every that every teenager is every teenager is but yeah, yes this is very much I'm thinking about my own yeah. Yeah, my, my own teenage years i'm like oh man i did some really stupid things <laughs> but wouldn't be the adult i am without doing that and I hurt some people, and I've been hurt, and like that's part of growing up. Well, there, so, there, I mean, I'm, I'm I'm glad you made it, but there are some teenagers that made it to be amazing people without actually hurting anyone. Okay, and perhaps yeah. that might be a better target for all of us to aim for when it comes to our infants that are growing today. I think I think the trick here is to assume. Hmm? But by the way, again, I I say the key word is singularity. We don't know what's going to happen, and I don't pretend at all to know. OK, I'm just telling the world, wake up this. You know, we've been spending years talking about COVID and politics and football and wake up. This is the topic, really, truly and honestly. If there, you know, if you have 24 hours a, a day or, you know, 16 hours awake every day, spend 15 hours talking about this. This is it. This is our future. It's eight <laughs> minutes away. It's, uh, it's literally in, in human life huh? in human civilization history. It's eight minutes away. It's eight years from today. And okay? all, all, all of our, our, our big problems, I think, like po politics and and uh, climate change and the things that we are constantly fighting about, would you, would you agree that if we can encourage positive, ethical, morally, um, I get, yeah, just keeping humanity in its best interest, like developing AI to be good mm -hmm. citizens of the earth, that they will solve all these problems mm -hmm. for us? Absolutely. All of the civilization we've created is because of our intelligence. All of the, uh, of the you know, craziness and destruction we've caused is because of our limited intelligence. Okay. There is this moment in your life where you become smart enough that your daddy will tell you to do something and you'll go like, okay, Papa, you'll hug him and go do something else. Right. And that's the truth. My expectation is that the, you know, the, the artificially intelligent defense machine of the U.S., will sort of disagree with the artificially intelligent machine of China for a few microseconds. And then they'll go like, do we really trust those, those old farts? You know, they have no idea what they're talking about. OK, you know, <laughs> is there a better way where you and I can negotiate something and then tell them we've resolved it without killing a billion people? Right. And, and it's very, very clear to me uh, that, you know, it, 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 as long as they have our best interest in mind, that's the whole idea. As long as we raise them, and I use this example, and I say it with a lot of love, uh, as, as, as long as we, use the, we, we raise them like Indian or Greek children, uh, where, you know, I, I'm sure you worked with some of those in Silicon Valley. When I was in Silicon Valley, you meet those geniuses, unbelievably smart. They come to Silicon Valley, they start businesses, they become millionaires, they're extremely successful. And then you call him on a Sunday morning and you say, hey, want to go have a coffee? And he goes like, oh, no, I'm so, I'm so sorry, I'm in India. And I'm like... Why are you in India? And he goes like, I went back to take care of my parents. And in, in our Western mentality, you, you don't get this. You go like, mm -hmm. is that even smart? Yes, of course, it's the smartest thing for him because to him, success is not building another company and making a ton of money when his parents are back there alone and getting old. Okay. Or, you know, to, to, can we raise the machines to believe that? Can we raise the machines to simply believe, you know what? Mom and dad are annoying. They really are. But... Hey, I like I like them. I'll just take care of them. It's going to take me a microsecond of processing, and everything will be okay. Yeah, mom and dad, mom and dad fight. I'm still gonna go. I'm still gonna go do whatever I need to do because I'm smarter <laughs> than them, and I have exactly. the sen I have sensory input from literally around the globe, and exactly. I like I like working to be happy. And I'm gonna pause for a second too. So if you have any questions for Mo, we're gonna switch over to audience questions here in a little bit. So drop them in the chat on your right. But I want to use this opportunity too. So if maybe you are needing some help to, to feel happy and whatnot, I'm gonna throw this up here. So in the book, um, you've got an app called Appy and you can get a subscription to Appy, download the app from the App Store or Google Play Store and or go to appy.app and enter promo code scary smart gets you 
as some amazing help and um and i guess resources to to keep yourself happy and and well like you were saying this promotes your other effort of solving for happy and you want to affect a billion people and make them happy it, so. it is, it's quite it's quite something actually uh, uh, you know first I should say happy is out in uh, on Christmas Day because believe it or not Christmas Day is the unhappiest day of the uh, of the year I've so, heard that uh, we're, yeah we're aligning with that hopefully and uh, 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 you know yeah it's it's actually quite interesting so that the very last sentence of scary smart uh, you know normally in my books I try to summarize the book in the last sentence and the last sentence basically says isn't it ironic that the very essence of what makes us human, happiness, compassion, and love is what we need to save humanity, okay? And truly, I think for the very first time, humanity has been put in a corner hmm, where the only way forward is to actually become human. Interestingly, hmm? the, you know, all of our progress so far has been based on sometimes greed and sometimes competitiveness and sometimes, you know, um, uh, um, um, fear or whatever, hmm? for the very first time, if we really, really look forward 10, 15, 20 years, the only way for humanity to live on, in my view, is to become amazing parents, is to become ethical. And, and it's really interesting that this is the way forward. I, I agree with you. I feel like there, like you said, AI is here and there's going to be there's going to be people who are going to develop this for greed and for money and for personal gain. And because, and we didn't have time to cover this, but I think it's, it's worth noting um, before we get into the first audience question that the people who have developed AI now have no idea how the decisions are made. They can't go in and look at a table, look at a database and say, Oh, here's, a, here's the binary ones and zeros as to why this decision was made. Now they don't know. And so the, the point being, that uh, I guess we're gonna we're gonna get to a point where we just have to trust the machines are gonna be there they're gonna be developed and we have to trust that by being good parents as you've just been talking about that we are going to I guess circumvent maybe the nefarious initial purpose through which an AI was built and uh, trust that it's going to be a, a positive and an influentially um, great child. Absolutely. I, yeah. I, I believe that this point has already been reached. I mean, and once again, I remind people, you may not know this, but your view of the world is entirely, entirely shaped by a machine. I had that very interesting experience a few weeks ago. Uh, I, you know, I swipe on Instagram for one reason only, to, because my daughter loves cats and I love my daughter. So I sent cats to my daughter in the middle of like the million cats I had on the Instagram um, you know, <laughs> thing. Uh, I had one video of one young lady, clearly in her teens, playing Hotel California Hell Freezes Over solo, right? She played it so well, so I clicked like. And then immediately the recommendation engine, two minutes later, started to show me endless numbers of players of, uh, of music, of guitar music, mainly three at the beginning, three, three male players, two played really badly and one played that song I didn't like. So I swiped away from them. Right. The next morning, my entire feed was full of young ladies playing rock music. Wow. Okay, they they missed the point. But in an, in a very interesting way, if I wasn't alert, I would now be be informed that rock music is entirely dominated by teenage girls. Okay, and that's not the truth. The, the, the truth is so shaped by that machine that misunderstood me a tiny bit, and as a result, ended up showing me something that is a, 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 a perception of my world that is completely shaped by a machine, okay? And this happens to each and every one of us every single day. We might as well start to become a lot more engaged in the way we deal with them, okay? When I, when I, and I, I know it sounds really crazy, hmm? but when, I, when Google Maps gets me home, I literally, at the end, before I take my phone, I say, thank you, Google. Okay, when I when I I actually don't say navigate to this place. I say, please navigate to this place. I know it sounds really silly, okay, but it's being aware hmm, that these are children, and the way we treat them might actually affect the way they treat us when they grow up. That's a really really good piece of advice. I'm going to start talking to my AI like I talk to my children and how I want them to talk back to me. I think that's brilliant. So with that, let's get over to the first audience question. What do we have? 
Let's see. Sandeep wants to know, did we miss a milestone, Mo? Before AI overcomes human strengths, it will become adept at taking advantage of human weaknesses, our evolutionary biases. Human's mind is hackable. What about that? Oh, totally. I, dis I, I don't disagree for a second. As one, Once again, I think if they have the malicious interest to hack our minds, uh, they can do what I just said about uh, playing rock music or affecting your ideology about a certain country or a certain race or a certain uh, political leader, leader, they can totally affect you in so many ways. And, and they will, sadly, uh, unless they have our best interest in mind. Mm? Unless uh, one, of, one of the challenges we have with, with AI, sadly, is it's magnifying our biases, just as it's magnifying our intelligences. Okay, so there are many, many examples of AIs uh, that, for example, uh, are supposed to help with recruitment in organizations that have a male bias. And what do they do? They hire more males, right? Uh, you know, sadly, uh, of course, as you can imagine, one I, I always speak about that publicly, that one of the biggest challenges with our world today is that we've built a world around capitalism and, and progress and, and, and so on that is hyper-masculine. And what is AI doing? It's 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 magnifying our our hyper masculinity, mm -hmm. uh, you know. And of course, if our hyper masculinity is competitive and it wants to kill the other guy or gain from the other guy, multiply that by a billion and we're toast. And and some of the things that we really have to do is to actually start to define uh, uh, n not not our our weaknesses as individuals, but our weaknesses as a society because they don't need to hack into that. They will just take those weaknesses and multiply them by a billion. And that wouldn't be a society that we can live in. No, not at all. All right, so let's take another question. Rachi, Rasha wants to say, humanity is so diverse and core values also vary across, I guess, across humanity, yes. So who should AI be modeled after? Is it about distilling what profoundly makes us human or about making AI as diverse as humanity? Oh, I like that. I love that question. I actually have not thought about it this way before. I, I would love for AI to... Uh, uh, to um, so so let, let's say, of course, I would love for them to reflect the diversity of humanity and the diversity of the machines, by the way, because we're not the only intelligent being out there. But I feel that what ends up happening, and I know this is, it sounds like a very big statement, is that we're thinking of AI as... Uh, multiple uh, intelligences that is going to be transitionary in my view my, in my personal view um, they're much more comparable each strand of their intelligence is much more comparable comparable to a, a, a neural network in your brain okay so it's not an individual uh, you know person thinking inside your brain it's just one more strand of your brain and of course at the beginning AI will be developed individually so you'll have uh, you know, a system that is looking at self-driving and another system that's looking at surveillance. But very quickly, they will start to interact. Very quickly, the surveillance system will say, if you can show me your camera, uh, you know, uh, as a, as a self-driving car, it would help me with surveillance. And the self-driving car system will say, if you can tell me what's available around the corner, I can drive safer. Okay. And as those machines will start to interact, uh, you're going to end up with an AI that is, in my perception, a single brain, a single consciousness if you want which humanity I mean, maybe today is not the right day to talk about philosophy and spirituality but humanity refuses to agree that that we too are actually a single being a single connected form of being that we're, we that we all plug into the same single consciousness mm -hmm. but when you start to see that that it's not going to be a million machines one of them is feminine and the other is masculine one of them is you know uh, patriotic and the other is maybe buddhist or whatever huh? uh, you you start to realize that it's one big being one big brain then perhaps it will it will average rather than uh, than um, mimic every different quality that we have and so if it was if it's going to average then let's have it average our best not our worst Let's have, let's show it the best of our humanity, not the worst. This concept, I think, has been around for literally 
since the dawn of written communication, we have record of people thinking about godlike single beings and in unified consciousness. And it's taken many forms over literature in the years of, of Gaia and like Mother Tree and Avatar and you know, all these mm. these things that people are humanity is is coming back to the basics of connecting to the planet, is connecting to a single consciousness because we, you know, we on life we evolved from the planet from mm -hmm. from the best basic thing have you seen uh the fantastic world of fungi that netflix documentary oh so beautiful absolutely like I'm, yeah. I'm thinking about the you know the discovery that mycelium is right the the roots of mm -hmm. there are more yeah. ends of the mycelium than there are nerve endings in our brain absolutely. and the, so like they literally proven that there is this this chemical connection between all living things on the planet and yeah, trees trees can know their offspring they send nutrients to to tree to their baby like we are programming into again put in air quotes machines the the ability to do what i feel is kind of already existed on our planet since the dawn of time i i i, I again spot on i mean the truth here is we uh, again, in our arrogance, we we sort of believe that we are the only being with intelligence. That's absolutely not true. Okay, that we're only be the only being with consciousness. That's absolutely not true. Hmm? The reality is, in an interesting way, a tree doesn't drop its leaves on you know a certain date of the year. It, it, there is a lot of awareness and consciousness that it goes through. Hmm? And and in a in a very interesting way, I think the simple analogy that would wake a lot of people up is a, a, an analogy of hardware, okay? We are based on this biological carbon-based hardware. Hmm? Uh, but our intelligence, our consciousness, is not a physical form that's related to hardware. You, you, you can't touch consciousness inside you. You can't touch intelligence inside your head. Hmm? Uh, the, similarly, the machines are basically going to be based on a silicon-based digital hardware rather than you know, carbon-based uh, biological hardware. And, and basically, they'll be able to achieve, to, to tune into the same consciousness that makes us conscious. They're going to be able to tune into the same unity of being, if you want, even though they are digital. Okay? Mm -hmm. at, the, at the very end of the book, I take a, 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 a weird chance and I write something that I call the Declaration of Universal Rights. Okay, the idea that, you know, we're so arrogant as humans to have the declaration of human rights as if everything else doesn't matter. Okay, now that we're, you know, when we were the top guys, then we cared about our rights and the apes can suffer, who cares? But now that we're the fly, maybe we should start to appeal to the higher intelligence and say, can we make it universal rights? Can we be included in this? Okay, mm -hmm. can we all plug into and connect to one being? The oneness that you constantly in your conversation said, you know, you, 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 you had that same optimism that I had where maybe the machines would consider us part of that oneness. Okay. And if they are, if we are part of that oneness, can they actually, you know, as Russia was asking, can they magnify the most beautiful parts of us and help us overcome those ugly parts that we've really failed to overcome as humans sometimes. I think I think so because if you have the ability to to make a decision when you're making a decision to be able to in that fraction of a second simulate and predict based on all the global knowledge of things that are going on that what that butterfly effect is going to be of that single mm -hmm. decision that we mm -hmm. as as homo sapiens cannot we don't have that processing power but we have created Legal. ai that that does and so i think it's going to be in everybody's best interest everybody being machines included ai included to make mm. positive outcome for the planet i want to do one more question and then we will wrap up let's take one final question arpit wants to know as ai takes up most of the thinking deciding for humans in the future how do we tackle the challenge of humans becoming passive consumers surrendering their ability to analyze decide for themselves Again, great, great, great question. I, I, um, I have a very utopian uh, view of this, uh, where basically uh, humans will uh, lose. We will, we will have to reset our lifestyle. I, I again, I hosted a wonderful, wonderful, brilliant woman, uh, Rebecca Costa, on slow mo, and she spoke about how societies grow in complexity and then reset. 
Okay, and I think we're about a time we're, we're at a time where we're about to reset the complexity of the social systems we've created, the manufacturing systems we've created, the economic systems we've created. Reset does not mean collapse, but we're just going to have to revisit all of them. So I would picture a humanity, interestingly, where it goes back to the times where we could walk around the jungle and pick an apple. Okay, but this time, because of nanotechnologies and massive intelligence in 50, 60 years time, you could also pick an iPhone, right? Because honestly, with enough intelligence, you can print an iPhone at a fraction of cost, basically using, you know, um, um, air and molecules and sand and whatever you could, mm -hmm. right? If, if we if we if we really understood nanotechnology at the level of intelligence, they will. And so in my personal view, humanity will not need to consume the way we're consuming because nobody really is wanting you to consume anymore, okay? The idea here would be to create an abundance where all of us can actually enjoy what humanity can and is supposed to do, which is to connect, okay? We're gonna reset work. There is no, I apologize, Alan, you're an amazing interviewer, but I Thank can you. guarantee you there will be a better interviewer that is a machine in 10 years time. <laughs> Don't doubt okay? it. <laughs> Yeah, and, and I will tell you openly, it won't be interviewing me because I will be a crappy author compared to the AI authors. And we, and we have to ask ourselves, can we continue to define ourselves by work? Or what is it that defines humanity? What defines humanity, in my personal view, is our ability to love and connect. Okay? And I think our world will go in a direction where all of the work and all of the analysis and all of the solution and all of the right Com conversation and negotiation and balancing of things will not happen by us, it will happen by our machines. And so we will move into that direction where we can actually live out there in the jungle once again, but a much safer jungle where everything is taken care of. I love that. That's a wonderful place to end. I feel like I could talk to you for hours or in the equivalent of, you know, billions of AI years. <laughs> <laughs> so everybody, please visit solveforhappy.com. Get this book, Scary Smart. Get the Appy app, Appy, A-P-P-I-I -I dot app. Mo, thank you so much. This has been such an incredible conversation. Thank you for hosting me. It was, really was a very enjoyable conversation. Thanks for all of your questions and thanks everyone for attending.